Right. Welcome back, everyone, to our second lecture today on uh, BC 310, Church and Ministry Administration. Um, let's pick up with some questions that we needed to uh, listen to. Uh, Christopher has a question, and I think um, Kennedy has a question uh, about privacy. Kennedy, do you want to uh, bring your, uh, you typed it in the chat, I see that. Um, talk about privacy. Um, did you have something specific on that, Kennedy? Yeah. Uh, what I just wanted to inquire is, is how to enforce uh, policies or codes of ethics in terms of privacy. How can it be done? Mm. Yeah. So, uh, one, uh, or at least the, the way we do it, one is we um, have it as part of our uh, employment or staff guidelines. Uh, we let our staff know the time of joining, when they are joining the, the church as a staff, uh, we let them know that all data, especially individual data, people's data information, uh, because you know it's all in the system. It's uh, so it's all data. Uh, all data is should be treated confidential. Um, they're not allowed to use it for any use other than the ministry of the church. Um, also, um, when we have somebody like the accountants who are handling you know, all the financial data. Um, we get them to uh, the finance, the accountant, or the people handling the accounts. They sign an additional document of confidentiality because they are looking at all the finances. So, other than for the work they they are doing and for any other legal purposes, uh, church finances should not be disclosed outside to public or discussed with other people. So, uh, you know, it's just to reinforce that, hey, uh, it's a privilege to be looking at all these numbers and know what's happening and where the contributions are coming from, but that has to be kept con confidential. Uh, another thing we do is uh, pastors are not given information on who's making the contribution. So, uh, so we have a pastoral team but the pastoral team doesn't know which individuals in the congregation or outside are giving how much money. That um, is done intentionally so that the pastors are not biased in when they minister to people. They, they don't know who's giving how much. That's not, they don't need to know. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that way, whoever comes for prayer, or ministry, they just treat everybody equally and fairly. It's only the accountant and the financial people who know, you know, and they may not know the names of the actual individuals who they are. But so, so these are some things. And then, of course, uh, to the software systems in which all the data is, that's access to that is given to people who need that. And uh, for example, we have, uh, and we will talk about this later, and also in the next semester course, um, we have a church management system. Uh, and then there, everything is tracked because you know everybody's data is there. And then uh, there is, of course, the log of who is what, who who does what with what data, so that all all of that is tracked. So people know that you cannot do anything with the data without it being tracked. Uh, so you know, uh, so there is that sense of responsibility for those who have access to the data to handle it carefully. So. Um, these are all things that are done within the organization to you know, ensure that uh, the confidentiality, the privacy, and the security of uh, uh, people and financial data within the organization. Okay, good question. Christopher, we'll take your question, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Pastor. Um, my question is actually with, uh, in relation to this um, dynamics of administration. And this is just a thought that, um, uh, you know, the leadership skills uh, in a church, uh, which uh, which I think can, can I, I know it can be incorporated in people's skills uh, possibly, but um, I just think that uh, 
if if it is if it is separated in a, in a sense where uh, you know as part of the dynamics it um, it really sort of focuses on the need for uh, strong leaders and I, I know that you know the the session you've uh, or rather the the last four Sundays you've you spent uh, you know on on leadership and I think it really talks to, uh, you know to the need for the strong leadership and how churches also you know uh, so grow uh, and you know have have different um, uh, churches uh, within that you know within the, the main church uh, also that also you know gives uh, uh, some some level of um, understanding of you know what the kind of skills that are required and then you know how it how it sort of you know can be used um, for interaction with possibly even the even the government in a in a, in a particular country uh, or on a city and uh, you know other, other external uh, uh, bodies that can uh, where the interaction is, re is required it also kind of makes it uh, in, in, an important thing where you know a church doesn't have just one leader and um, sometimes those leaders have have you know let that uh, let that church uh, stray so yeah just just a thought over here with regards to the dynamics mm -hmm. okay thank you yeah so it's good to you know i guess what christopher's saying is that it, it, it this this whole all of this requires a uh, skill which can come together when there are more people involved and and uh, you know you can have more people more leaders doing this and it doesn't have to be just one pastor but leadership yeah uh, abraham's question in the chat um, for a group of 20 people what is the first thing to consider in administration yes abraham we're going to get into that uh, from the very next chapter uh, and we will uh, start explaining you know how to build this whole thing how do you build it from ground up okay so we're going to address that step by step so as we journey through the course that's what we're going to do um, so you know just a, just a quick background uh, when APC started uh, we had our first Sunday service uh, on February 18th 2001 and you know which was just an inf informal gathering in in the house in, in, in the living room and we, that's how the church started we just had maybe 10 or 12 people there now the first thing that we did short so in the, in the beginning the very first you know from the very first Sunday uh, I used to write the account so we had a little small book where whatever offering people put in a bag I counted put it there and then I kept it aside because at that point we had not yet registered the church or we didn't have a bank account and just 10, 12 people. So the first thing we had to do was to form a legal entity, which is what we're going to talk about in the next chapter, chapter three. Right? So we were sure that you know God has called us to do this work and so there's no turning back. So we just got to go forward first thing to do is to form a legal entity. Uh, we had a name, we knew we wanted to call the church All People's Church. Um, that was based on you know, what we read, read in the book of Revelation, chapter five, also in chapter seven, where John sees you know, people from all nations, tribes and tongues standing before God. So that's where the inspiration for all people you know, came. So he said, okay, we'll call the church All People's Church. So we had that already in our mind. So the first thing was to go and get a legal entity formed. And um, so we went to a, you know, a chartered accountant, uh, an accounting firm whom we knew, and they helped us with the process of registering all people's church as a legal entity. And then, uh, so I will share how, how we go about it. And then, uh, so to form a legal entity, you need at least three people. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about India. Uh, this could vary from country to country. But in India, uh, I think you, yeah, you need at least three people. So uh, we waited for a little bit. We had to wait a couple of months till uh, 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 there were two, two other, another couple um, who, whom 
I knew from a long time who had come and started a part of our, they started attending uh, All People's Church. They just, and we were still very small, but they were there. And we had a good rap or a good connection. I felt that it was God who you know sent them back, sent them to be part of this. And so four of us, uh, 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 Amy, my wife, myself, uh, Georgie, and his wife, uh, Joyce, four of us were the initial trustees of that legal entity, right? Or you would call them uh, uh, and, and different different people call them different uh, 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 things. So they could be, you know, directors or uh, you know the governing body or whatever. But here we locally call for a religious organization here in India we call them trustees. So they became the trustees, and with these four names on the trust, the legal entity was formed. And it was a simple process. You have to have all the paperwork done, go and register it with the government. And then once that is done, then we could open a bank account. So we opened a bank account right away in the name of All People's Church. So whatever money I had collected, you know, so the first few months when people gave offerings, we just collected it, kept it there, uh, we were able to put it into the bank account. Uh, uh, other than the, the the money that was spent for expenses. It's also recorded in a small notebook. Uh, and so we were still a small group of just 20 people or less at that time. But the legal entity was established, a bank account was opened, and then from then on, anybody who, you know, whatever offering came, we could deposit it in the bank account. And if pe pe people could also write checks in the name of All People's Church, it will go into the bank account. If people wanted to do direct transfer, you know, they could directly transfer it into the bank account, but that was kept separate. So we did that within the first few months of having started. I think it all, by June, it was all in place, right? So we started in February, March, April, May, June, within the first four months, um, uh, 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 it was all put in place. And uh, so that's how we started. And we did not have any paid staff. Uh, I was, you know, I, I was running uh, a business, a software business. So that was where my personal income would come. The church income was very small in those days, and uh, um, uh, and then so we didn't have any stuff. Right. So the main expenses would were for the renting of the venue and so on. Um, and that's how it got started. And I will we'll get into that. Um, Kennedy, I see a question from Kennedy. Is it in order to tabulate all the tithing of everyone in a church by the end of the year as done in some churches? Now, Kennedy, I would, so Kennedy's question is, should we record, you know, what each person is giving and tithing to the church? Now, we don't do that because in India, it's not a legal requirement, but in some countries, it's legally you have to do it. For instance, in the United States, uh, you record what each one gives by their social security number, so that at the end of the year, for the next next year, you send them a letter saying the previous calendar year you you, you contributed so much, and then then therefore they could get a tax deductible tax deduction on it. So they get a tax benefit for contributing to uh, a religious organization. In India, doesn't that there's no tax benefit, so people give to the church, uh, but they don't get any tax deduction, no tax benefit, uh, and so we do not track, you know, who gives what. No, so my response to that question would be, if it is legally required, do it. If it's not legal legally required, then there's no need to do it, um, unless. Um, yeah, I don't think it's even need needed so that there is no bias towards anybody. Uh, but the software system that I'll talk about later, later on has the functionality. You can track it if, if, if needed. Okay. All right, so let's get into Chapter 3 now. Um, just how do you get all of this started, get off the ground, right? So we, we've talked about in Chapter 2, we talked about the objectives. Now we get into Chapter 3. Right. So the first 
step that we would take is to form when I, I when I'm, I'm using a word called trust um, um, actually uh, this may not be the same word that you would use in your country in India we, uh, a, a, a religious entity is called a trust right so it's called a church trust but for instance in in, in the US you would call it a non-profit right so if I use the word trust then think about it as a non-profit um, and a religious non-profit organization so in your country it may be called differently uh, maybe I should change this word uh, make it more generic but anyway so when I say church trust I mean a church non-profit and uh, uh, the first thing of course is to form this non-profit uh, as a legal entity and uh, and 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 put in the governance that's going to take place, right? So let me just share a few thoughts here. Now, uh, why should there be church governance, and why should the church be established as a legal entity? Um, and some of the things that we need to keep in mind biblically, right? The first thing is the Bible teaches us to submit to civic authorities. You know. So the church is functioning inside, while the church is a spiritual body, it's the body of Christ. We are, we are people. We are citizens of a country. And as citizens of the country, we are supposed to submit to the civic authorities, Romans 13, 1 through 7. And so from that perspective, even the church as a legal entity should be in submission to the rules, the regulations of the government. Now, I realize that there are some people who will argue against this. They say, no, 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 the church is about the government and you know, the church doesn't have to submit to the government. But that I, I, I don't subscribe to that. I believe that as citizens of the country, we must obey the rules and the laws of the country. And if we don't obey the rules and the laws, then of course the government has the right to take action against us. That is, even if you know the church, because you're not following the rules. So, from a perspective of being submitted to authorities, we must follow the the regulations so that everybody you know is uh, is obeying the the law. Secondly, why is this church governance important? So that we can be blameless. In how we conduct ourselves in the ministry, you know, in in Second Corinthians chapter six, uh, the Apop apostle Paul is talking about uh, the minister, and he says, you know, we uh, we give no offense in anything, so that the ministry may not be blamed. You know, Second Corinthians six and verse four, he says, you know, we uh, we commend ourselves as ministers to God, verse three and four, and we don't offend anything in any way, so that the ministry may not be blamed. Uh, maybe somebody can read it. I know I just quoted it, but it'll be nice if somebody could read that. Second Corinthians chapter six, verses three and four, please. Anyone? Second Corinthians chapter six, verse three and four. Andy? Go ahead, Shri Kumar. Thank you. Uh, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in aff afflictions, in necessities, in distress. Hmm. Notice he says verse 3, you know, we give no offense in anything so that the ministry may not be blamed. That's so important. Right? We don't want anybody to point a finger at the ministry and say, look, we're not doing what is right. Right? So uh, uh, that's a second reason why we should have good governance. Um, thirdly, uh, we want to be honorable before God and men, especially in the way we handle money. And uh, uh, remember, the contributions that are being given are donations. Many people are giving it out of the free will, and therefore there is so much more accountability to the public in the handling of the finances. So 2 Corinthians 8.21, Paul says, you know, we, um, we want to do whatever is honorable in the sight of God 
and man and the context there is handling money second corinthians chapter 8 right? and then at a personal level of course you want to have a clear conscience right that you know that you're doing everything right and well and uh, otherwise your own conscience is going to tell you you're doing something wrong right so for all of these reasons you know governance accountability is very important so how do you get started and this is where abraham you know he he asked a question so what i would say is wait until you see a core group of people uh, um, you know who are part of the church part of your ministry they're going to be there and then uh, and then you register or you incorporate or you form a legal entity as soon as you can right so you're getting your ministry started uh, we will be talking on that church planting course or you know whatever ministry you're, you're getting started you have a core co group of people who are part of that vision once that happens then form a legal entity as soon as possible don't delay why because if if you're not a legal entity then doing the ministry can you know can can be questioned people say who gives the right to do this you know or, you know if you want to go rent a place so who, who's renting the place you have a you know uh, so that so many things but if you are a legal entity then immediately you have the backing of the local government because you're entitled you know you're, you have the legal right to carry out whatever the activities of that organization have been stated as so uh, i would encourage you to do that now the problem at least that what what i observe in india and I don't know how it is in other countries, but in India, what have what I've noticed very often is people who plant churches, they just keep running. You know, they 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 start a service and they start doing things, and they have not formed a legal entity. Uh, you know, for ex and and it makes things very difficult for them. Uh, you know, when the when the police come and ask, you know, hey, wow, who gave you the right to do that? I mean, what are you doing? Uh, because they're not legally registered. Uh, and then, of course, they will call it as persecution. But then, you know, the police are just doing their job. That you know, you've got to be, you've got to have some, uh, you know, standing here to be uh, uh, having a church or running this. And uh, even in terms of collecting money, you know, if if the pastor is just collecting the offerings and putting it into his personal account, that is a dangerous thing. You know. Uh, uh, but then many people do that because they haven't formed the legal entity. They just collect the offering, they put it in the personal account, or just just run it, run with that. So we can avoid all of these problems if you form the legal entity as soon as possible, at your earliest. Now, why is that important? Forming a legal entity, it gives you credibility. You know uh, that uh, uh, people uh, are not just doing things informally. Uh, donors also will give to an organization because there's a legal name to it, there's a bank account, so on. Uh, it gives you separate entity status. That means, uh, you know, you don't mix up the bank account of the organization with your personal things. These all are kept separate. Mm, there's also limited liability, you're, you're protected, uh, so that if anything goes wrong, uh, your personal uh, belongings, your personal money, or so on, is not brought into uh, to the, to the situation to handle any debt or liability. Right. So there is also protection for for the people who are leading it. Uh, you'll be able to enlist professional services. So, you know, if you want to hire an accountant or others, uh, they will be willing to work for an organization uh, and provide their services. Uh, in some countries, uh, having a nonprofit registered gives you tax exempt status for the donors, for those who give, and so on. And you may also have access to grants and so on uh, as a legal entity. Right? Um, and of course, um, you could incorporate your organization as a religious organization or as a non-government organization, typically an NGO. Now. Uh, that's the distinction we have here in India. Uh, in other countries, 
they may not necessarily have that distinction. Everything is a non-profit organization. Non-profit could be a religious or a social organization as well. But in India, we distinguish between a religious organization and a non-government, which could be involved in social activities. Right? Uh, so whatever that best suits the kind of work you do, uh, you would incorporate that. But if it's a religious, you're doing Christian ministry, then definitely you know, you would do it as a religious organization. Uh, what I feel is very wrong is uh, to, uh, people don't want to say that they're doing religious work and they just form a non-government organization. Um, and then they then they do religious work and then it kind of gets them into trouble. Uh, uh, and so we should avoid that. If you're going to do religious work, like teaching the Bible, preaching the Bible, as part of what you're doing, as a core part of what you're doing, then it's better to be a religious organization and uh, you know, make, make sure that there is no grounds on which um, the government can hold you uh, uh, against, you know, that you register as an NGO, but you're doing religious work. So anyway, those are things you need to think about very clearly. Or if you're going to be a school, then that's an educational organization. And the benefits for these organizations are different. Here, at least in India, there, there are certain things that an NGO or an educational organization would have, which a religious organization will not have. Um, and this can vary across countries. But the idea is form the right kind of organization appropriate for the kind of ministry you're going to do, right? A related question is, when should I form this entity? Um, like I mentioned earlier, do it as soon as possible, uh, at the earliest possible. But there are, of course, certain things you need to be looking at. Make sure that you know, you've got the work off the ground, that, that it is gaining momentum. Uh, understand uh, what are the best options. Let me take some time to see, you know, should I form a religious, should I form a non-government, should I form an educational? You know, try to understand which is the best option for what the kind of ministry you're doing. Have a core team because you will need uh, more than one person to form the entity. So in most places you need at least three people. Uh, there will be some initial expenses to get the work done. So you need to collect some sufficient funds. People can contribute and you hold that money in hand to pay for the expenses. Uh, you will need the help of a accounting firm or you know, some someone will help you do this right, to incorporate it. So contact them and you'll have to pay their fees as well. So make sure you have enough money for that. And then you need to finalize the articles of incorporation. And I will go through a sample, right? So you need to have what we call as a trust deed or bylaws or articles of incorporation. You know, they use different language for it in different places, but you need to have that written out and I will I've shared a sample of that. And then you know you need a core team. You need at least three people to form a legal entity. So for that, how would you select those people? Now in some cases you can, you know, if your spouse and you are doing work together or you know, so you can. But in some cases you're not allowed to have a spouse or they have certain combination. That means Two thirds of the people on the trust should not be related, right? Uh, so, a husband and wife can be uh, trustees, office bearers, or uh, directors, but you should have more people than the two, right? So that there is um, there is uh, a balance, especially in making decisions. So you have to follow those rules, um, depending on the country in which you are uh, forming this entity. Typically, you'll need people who are aligned to the vision, uh, people who are willing to serve, and people that you have a good relationship with. You know, you've got to be very careful. Otherwise, if there is problems between the, the office bearers, then the whole organization will come to a standstill and things won't get done. There'll be a lot of conflict and so on. So you've got to be careful, right? So bring, get the right people in who've got the right heart, they're flowing with the vision, and so on. And of course, you have the option to change people. So in the, you know, uh, if there's a need, 
uh, you know that there's a process by which uh, people can step down and new people can be added in their place or you can expand uh, the number of trustees or office bearers and um, typically not always but typically you'd want to have an odd number of people like three or five or seven so that you know in case you need to you know kind of take a vote on something there is a decision that's arrived at okay but it's not a not a rule it's just a general thing that people follow and so then you need to write articles of incorporation let me just quickly go through a sample and uh, um, you know this again varies from country to country but uh, uh, here's um, the sample of you know of what we did here for ABC uh, so when we formed our trust our people's church this is what a trust deed or the articles of incorporation would look like you would name the people you know the four or five people or whoever and um, uh, in all this language will be, and then uh, you will give the name of the trust uh, you'll have to make an initial you know amount of money that's being put into the organization it could be any amount small amount and this is the name of the trust so this would be all people's church and then you say what are the name of aims and objectives right so this is a religious trust so we are here to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, we could and and then you know one of the things we did was to keep it as open and as broad and as wide as possible so that anything we wanted to do in the future we would be able to do it uh, and this was, was advised to us by our chartered accountant who was helping us so you know we put down anything and everything kind of work that a church or a ministry would ever want to do you know uh, social work uh, media work church planting work Bible college institutions work, uh, you know, supporting uh, other Bible teachers, so on, uh, 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 getting people together, conferences, workshops, and so on, uh, even uh, doing research type of work, um, and so on, you know, uh, or any other kinds of organizations that you want to set up, like fellowships, discipleship. We can, we can work anywhere in India and uh, anything and then we can also support other organizations that are similar to us we can buy land or lease and buy land um, we can you know sell what we bought land and uh, yeah and other things that that are related to how we will manage the money we can give to other organizations we can open branches anywhere in india and uh, we can provide accommodation to educate and assist so basically everything that you can think of which a church would want to be doing you try to put it in here so that later on you shouldn't be you know const feel constrained that oh i'm not able to do this it needs to be specified in your articles and remember um this document people will come back to as a reference point if anything they need to make any decisions right and if uh, um, uh, uh, if any anything needs to happen so all of that has to be put down here in in the trust so you can you know those of you interested you can read through this document i've shared it with you uh, and uh, please keep in mind this was written for india so uh, it may vary in your country and of course it'll vary in other part you know maybe in the u.s and others but this is just a sample uh, and uh, and how how this is set up okay so so you need to uh you know write out these articles of incorporation and a, a good chartered accountant in your city will be able to help you do that okay and make sure that so once the moment you have a legal entity formed you will need to follow the regulatory requirements that are in your state or in your country so which means that uh, we need to file annual reports um, uh, we need to uh, you know report on what's going on to the government so those things have to go on 
and then you'll also have to have meetings and discussions with your own trustees that means the people whose names are put on the thing they need to talk periodically and record their meetings and so on uh, um, that has to happen okay let me pause here and see if there are any questions uh, you're all with me oh okay you couldn't see what i was showing you you couldn't see the sample okay okay let me just quickly share that all right so i was just taking you through this document uh, can you see it now Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm just taking you through this document, and this has been uh, I've shared it with you in the classwork section. So, um, so this is just a document. This is a sample, so you can take it and modify it. And and uh, like I said, just keep in mind this is done for India. It may vary in uh, different parts of the world. So as you can re as you read through it, you'll find that you know we made it as broad as possible so that. Um, uh, we could, you know, keep it open for the ministry to do anything that needed to be done, and so uh, all of this is there. This is like the articles of income. This is how you form the legal entity. Okay, uh, it's available. You can download it and 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 use it. So let me just go back here. Now, okay, uh, we'll take a few questions before we uh, wrap up and. Bring the the cluster close here. So Abraham has a question. In a place like Vietnam, you need to join another church so they can help you. The churches have their own demands. Hmm. Uh, okay. So. Uh, okay, let me answer. Roshan, uh, uh, where can I download the sample? So I have uh, uploaded all these files in the in the Google Classroom, the uh, Classwork section. So the file is there, so you can just download it from there in the Google, the same Google Classroom. Okay. Um, so Kennedy's question is: um, So should it operate like a limited liability, limited company? Yes, you know, it's a legal entity, and in many ways, it operates like a limited liability company they just you know it's called differently because it's treated differently by the government okay a religious entity or a non-profit okay and so abraham your question about vietnam uh, I, I i don't understand the scenario there do you want to explain it to us so that maybe we could try and share some thoughts on it Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Sir. Yes, sir. Um, I'm trying to find a balance between what we are learning and the practical issues that we face here. And Vietnam, I think we started trying to get a legal document so that we can do whatever the Spirit of God wants us to do. But I, I had to talk to two pastors. The first one told me that uh, he has to know me, and we have to bring our our members to his church to fellowship for maybe about a year or two, or maybe probably a year. Then on that note, he can at least submit our credentials to the government that we are from maybe Africa or we are foreigners and want a legal document to fellowship on our own. That is the first requirement he gave me. but. Unfortunately, most of our people too, most of them are joining online. And the timing that they, uh, the time that they have their meetings is different from the time we have our meetings. So that was the first challenge. Then I also spoke to another pastor. He has pleased to be the, the president of the Baptist church here in Vietnam. He is willing to help. And the first thing he, he told us was to look for a venue. He will come and rent it in his own name. Then from there, he can help us to get the legal document. 
But when we look at the Baptist Church too, and what we also believe, uh, we, we kind of believe in speaking of in tongues more, but they don't. And once you, you, you come under them, you have to obviously submit to uh, them. So I'm looking at how we can balance the fact that we believe in tongues and all these things and how, how to, I mean, uh, get ourselves to go along with them. And once they register the place for us, it means that when they're having a program, they would like to invite us and we have to be available. You know, mm -hmm. and then the, the last option that we had was, by God's grace, we've been looking for a venue too and we find a place. This place has already been registered. I mean, they used to have it for like a church some years ago and now they still have the document to, to allow, I mean, to use the venue as a church. So when we got there, the place is not very good for us because it's hard to locate the place. Most of the people are foreigners. But that venue has been registered. So it's either we go to that venue and stay there for a year. And of course, if the people want to come, we have to look for ways to help them to locate the venue. Or we go to the, with the Baptist church, we look for a new venue, he comes to register for us. Or we take our members to uh, the other church that is saying that we should bring our church uh, members before they can help us. So this is the options we have. And uh, Pastor, this has taken me almost about two, two, three months now. I don't know what to do. So Abraham, it's, is it not, uh, is, can't you go directly, can't you go directly to say um, the registrar, like the, the place where, you know, Companies, nonprofits, churches register like the registrar's office, uh, or you go to a chartered accountant. Somebody will help you do the registration, and talk to them, and say, uh, you know, we have a community here of people, uh, and we want to form a, a, a legal entity, a religious organization. Uh, we want to call it by this name. Can you tell us what is the procedure? So then. You know, you and maybe two or three other people can form your own organization directly. Is that possible? Uh, I have not made that inquiry yet, but I had to talk to some leaders and some Vietnamese pastors. And the advice they give me is, is to join other churches and do that procedure. But maybe I have to step back and, and go and find out myself. Mm. Maybe the Spirit of God will grant us grace and favor. Yeah, so try it uh, and uh, see if you can. I mean, yeah, it, it may uh, involve a little bit of money, but you can all pull it together and then you can do it. So that way you'll be completely free. You'll have a legal entity. Either your, your name will be on it and maybe two or three other people that, you know, that your core team, and you'll have complete freedom to do what you want. And you can open your bank the bank account in the name of the ministry. You can... Uh, read, you know, book a venue in the name of that ministry, and so you'll have complete freedom. Um, so I, I would encourage you to just explore that option, see what happens. Okay, Pastor. Yeah, thank you so much, Pastor. All right, we have time for one last question. I think did Kennedy raise his hand or? Anyone else? Any last question? Okay, um, so we had a little bit left in chapter three, which we will cover uh, towards the to cover next week and then go forward. So just to sum up what we did um, today, we talked in first lecture. We talked about the objectives of good organization. Why are we interested in having a good uh, administration, good organization for the ministry? And then we began our journey today on you know how do you go about it? The first step is to form a legal entity wherever you are and uh, you know get started with that you know so because then everything is uh, legal you are accountable to the government and uh, you know you personally won't get into trouble uh, when you start doing the ministry uh, and so uh, that that that's a, that's the right thing to do so as soon as possible try and get that in place uh, it of course will vary in different parts of the world, but you can get information and work on it. Okay, um, 
we'll, we'll finish chapter three next week and then get, go forward from there. Okay. Um, could somebody please uh, pray with us, close and dismiss the class and then, yeah. Who would like to pray? Pastor, can I pray? Okay, go ahead. Sure. We shall start to be thank you and praise you, honor you, God, for this wonderful day which you have given to us, your God. We pray that, Father God, you promised us, Father God, I will build my church. And, Father God, the, the gates of the hell will never prevail over it. Father, we pray that everything what we learn today, your God, Master, that we able to implement in our ministry so that we can able to use it, O oh Lord, Master, to build your kingdom, build the church of Father God with confidence and with faith and with the power of the truth of Father so that we can able to rise up, O oh Lord, Master, for your glory. We can able to stand up for your glory as it is written in Isaiah 6 to you, Father God. We could able to rise up, O oh Father God, against the power of darkness, O oh Father. We pray that everything what we learn today, let it deeply rooted in us, O oh Father God. Let it change and renew our mindset, O oh Father God. And we pray that, Father, let we able to stand strong in the truth. And Father, we can able to glorify your holy name. Thank you, Father God, for using your servant of God. Father, cover him. Lord, Master, lead him. And thank you, Father God. Lord, you blessed each one of our hearts, oh, Father God. Thank you once again for answering our prayers and teaching us, Lord, Master, through the spirit of wisdom and understanding and knowledge of God. We give you all the glory, honor, and praises, Lord, Master. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Master. Amen. Man, thank you, everyone. It's good to have you all in class. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. See you again soon. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. See you. Have a great day, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Pastor. Thank you. God bless. Bye now. Bye now. See you all soon.